to Welcome to the Perky Color Radio and TV Show. I'm your host, David M. Frankel, and our guest tonight is Kerry Howell, and he is the founder of SC Truffiers and Howell Specialty Farms. Let's welcome Kerry. Welcome. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And the first thing you have to notice, those that are watching this on TV or on yeah. social media, we gotta do the is how good looking Mr. <laughs> Kerry is this evening. And uh, a big reason why he's so good looking this evening, I didn't, I didn't sell him the blazer, but his collar <laughs> looks pristine. That's step one. And the pocket square he has is, is a designer fabric, uh, which looks fantastic as well. So those of you who are wondering how good looking, he, how do you get so good looking, it's, those are all Perky products. So go to PerkyLLC.com and get yours today. Enough with the plug. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My yeah. pleasure. So tell right. us about uh, SC Truffiers. I had to practice that before we went on air. Yes. Uh, and Howell Specialty Farms. Yeah. Where did you get started and what inspired you to, to develop this farm? We started in um, back in uh, 2013. Okay. We moved from uh, Charlotte, the Ballantyne area. We moved in, into Indian land. Okay. Not too far. And um, what, what set us on this path was I... I I was growing my, uh, I had a little garden right there, you know, in the Ballantine area, you know, and I saw where the, uh, uh, the uh, what do you call those, the uh, the people that come and do the lawn, okay. the landscape, landscaping, the people? landscaping. They, they came and they just didn't respect what I had there. And, you a know, bunch of grass on top of your garden. And my wife, she didn't, she did, she didn't care much for the direction that the neighborhood was going, so we, we, uh, we ventured out. Um, that's a story within itself, but we uh, long story. A lot of restrictions in Valentine too. I oh so. yeah, yeah. Long story short, we moved out to Indian Land. We found some property. We found uh, it started out at uh, eleven acres, and then wow. eventually we're we're on eighteen acres now. Um, and I said, well, you know, let's have the place, you know, pay for itself. So right. you know, so we uh, we started a farm. Um, we got some crops, and we didn't we didn't know anything. We didn't know anything about farming, and so uh, it was it was a lesson that uh, uh, we had to take to heart. Um, Give us an example. Well, I know my we, wife learned that watermelons like to take over. <laughs> Give us an example of something you planted, and then that killed everything, and you had yeah. one big watermelon. I'll give you an example. Well, <laughs> see, um, in. In the South, by the way, I'm I'm uh, in the process of starting a, uh, a YouTube channel called the uh, Red Dirt Market Gardening. Okay. And it's about farming here in the South, and um, it deals with the aspect of uh, how to deal with the uh, the challenges of farming in the soil that we have here. It's because clay. what you yeah, it's clay. It, right. Basically, what you have is subsoil, mm -hmm. and you have to remediate that soil, and we had to go to we had to go through a lot of uh, uh, education on learning how to do that. We went to uh, uh, Mother Earth news fairs. We went to uh, organic grower schools, and uh, through Clemson, we went to the uh, New and Beginning Farmers class and things like that. And and we we got an education on how to uh, remediate soil and. Um, what to do we our thing is with the the uh, uh specialty farms is that we're market gardening now market gardening is a it's an up and coming thing especially among uh people uh like your millennials and such as that um most of your farmers in this day and age are in their 60s mm. uh if you go back, my grandfather was a farmer from way back. You know, he farmed cotton and wheat and stuff such as that. Sure. Um, that could probably change. Today, <laughs> it's called market gardening, uh, where you have people uh, like the Curtis Stones, the Jean Martin Fortiers, who have their books out there, and they're they're really crushing it at the uh, farmers markets and restaurants. They're they, and they're, by the way, they're only doing, doing this on a quarter acre. Wow. They're making $100,000 a year on a quarter acre. Wow. Yeah. So I took it another uh, to another level um, where I looked at what I had as far as the soil. I didn't want to remediate all that soil. And then I said to myself, well, now what can I grow that wouldn't require such remediation? And, and it came to me. You know, I had been to France a number of times in it. Truffles, you know, truffles—they they love a clay-like soil, 
And a matter of fact, we just got back in from Barcelona and we saw the soil was, it wasn't any different from what we have here, with the exception that the soil over there is, uh, it, there's a lot of lime in it. Mm -hmm. And here, you don't have that much lime in the soils uh, here because the soil is very acidic. It's, it's a very, uh, very low pH. Over there, it's pretty high. Um, and uh, as you, you'll probably see in some of the uh, stills uh, where uh, there's dog hunting truffles and such as that. And the truffles right now, they're going for approximately uh, $1,500 a pound. Wow. Yeah, so and that's just the black trouble. That's what we're we're attempting to grow here in the uh, in South Carolina. So let me pause you. Everyone watching this, fifteen hundred dollars a pound. I want to repeat that one more time. <laughs> yeah, it's fifteen hundred. If you live in Charlotte and you're not making truffles in your backyard, shame on you. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's just one of the crops. That's our specialty crop, and we we do a, a number of other crops. Um, you mentioned hard times and some of the things that we. Uh, um, What's the lesson you learned, for example? Something you tried to plant and it just didn't work out? And well, when we first started. Because <laughs> it's okay to fail, people. It's okay to fail as long as you learn from it. It is. Failing it's, over it's, and over it's, again, it's expecting different okay results, to, that's a definition you know of good, insanity. You know what's good about failing is you can mark it up. You can, you can go back and, you know, uh, and here's, here's what my wife loves to do. She loves to teach. She loves to teach people, you know, people that, that come to her with, uh, and, and we still fail along the way, and we have mentors, you know, we have mentors uh, like uh, uh, Ray Tyler, and in, in, uh, he's in uh, Tennessee, and then we have uh, uh, another market gardener, uh, Patrick, uh, 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 Michael Kilpatrick, you know, these people, they help us out a lot, you know, we, we get on the phone, we talk to them, hey, what's going on with this? You know why is uh, why are my tomatoes looking like this? And, right. and, and you know, they help us out so so immensely. And um, the one of the challenges we had, we first had was we we didn't remediate the soil, and we thought we could put something in the ground and not have remediated it. And so you know, <laughs> we put we put we put we planted okra. We put and only one of them came up. Only one okra, and it was, it was about that high, and one okra on it. And we were like, "What? Well, what's going on?" So we had to, we had to learn. You had to, you, you really have to learn about soils, and how to remediate them. You know. Um, so if you wanted to live off the land, you weren't eating that day. No, not at all. You were starved. <laughs> Understandable. And so, um, we we sent a soil analysis off to Clemson, and they told us uh, the uh, the different uh, things that. Uh, were wrong with our soils and such as that, and we had to get in there and remediate that soil, you know. And and now we have uh, um, we we purchased a uh, a high tunnel. They call that uh, some people call it a greenhouse, and it's we purchased that through the uh, uh, um, USDA cost share program, okay. um, and that's been a blessing because we've uh, we can. With that, we can extend our seasons. We can extend our growing seasons, and such as that. You know, and we we the reason some of the some of the reasons why we've done this is because not only do we want to we want people to have local produce, we want them to also uh, not only know where their food comes from, but know what's in it. Exactly. You know, and uh, we we. That was one of the reasons why we got into it as well. You know, we uh, we wanted to grow our own food. We wanted to, you know, we, all of our produce is, is organic. We grow organically. We use we use the organic protocol, and um, we just take it from there. Um, we, we grow the uh, fruits and vegetables, and we have bees. I had learned about that too. Oh Lord, it, it takes a few stings to get. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm a certified beekeeper there in South Carolina, and I'm, I'll be going for my journeyman's uh, uh, um, certification uh, once again. And um, uh, this is some of our honey that we brought here. Excellent. Yeah. We send our honey off each year to the University of Texas A&M to uh, be analyzed. And uh, they, they can, uh, uh, the gentleman there uh, at the University of Texas named Von Bryant, he... 
he goes in and he tells uh, he can tell you where what type of pollen has been in that honey and he'll make a list of of, uh, of things that possible things you know you, you'll see things on there like cannabis wait, wait a minute what somebody growing that around right, exactly. <laughs> where did that bee come it, from yeah <laughs> wasn't my bee was right. um there's a bee yeah they actually i had to learn about bees you know they they travel they can travel up to five miles for uh when they come back to the when they go out they'll in forage they'll bring bring back three things it's water uh pollen and of course nectar and then and the nectar is how they make their honey but uh, yeah. that's a long story within itself but i, I enjoy being a beekeeper um of course i, I don't enjoy the stings but uh, you know it's <laughs> it's, it's a learning time. process <laughs> And so, now I know uh, flavored honey has become a big thing. Have you dealt with oh, yeah. flavored honey yet? Or? This honey, I've had people from Israel say, oh, man, you have the best honey. I took one, uh, uh, we sold it to one guy, and he he, he just stopped his wife from doing it. You've got to taste this. You've got to <laughs> taste it. The flavor, it, I mean, it's just bursting, the, you know, the floral, you know. And it's it's what the bees have uh, uh, where the bees have been, and we we try to plant a lot of it. When we our first year, it was like uh, there was a lot of when when I sent the analysis off, it came back there was a lot of blackberries in there, hmm. a lot of blackberries and a lot of roses, and it made for a very tasty honey. Hmm. So um, interesting, yeah. yeah. You ever think about where the bees have traveled affecting oh, the flavor yeah, of the honey? I, I, but it makes sense. You see them everywhere. I see them in my trash cans. What is he doing here? Right. <laughs> it's always like comical. Like, where have you been? Where have bees been? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Asking for a background check on the bees. Before yeah. You know what they're, yeah. You know, Matter of fact, Bob Bright, flavor. he uses the, the pollen analysis, uh, and they use him uh, for crime scenes and stuff like that. Hmm. So uh, he can tell where things have been from the pollen. It's, uh, yeah. So he uses that. And, but there's, there's one other company that uh, it's overseas in Germany. Uh, they'll be doing analysis for me uh, in the coming years, and not only will they be doing pollen analysis, they'll be doing uh, GMO and whatever uh, type of chemical that the uh, bee might have gotten into. So we, we we and we send it for everybody that purchases from us. We we give them a free analysis. Oh, very good. Yeah. And are there any? I know my wife's a big honey fan and buys local honey. Uh, do you have any suggestions on things to put honey in to help with? Health and you know obviously um, we're in the cold and flu season right now. But what could they yeah, what could they could, put it into to enhance health and wellness? You could actually uh, put uh, garlic in honey. I know that sounds weird, but um, like she puts it in tea, for example. She yeah, puts the honey in tea. Is yeah, there, what could, else would you put honey into to help with health and wellness? Oh, there's not a, necessarily there's, things to add to the honey, but what should honey be added to to enhance the uh, we, value of the health. Mostly teas. Mostly, mostly teas. teas. Okay. Yeah, I would say mostly I was looking teas. for a secret besides uh, that tea. I can't give you any secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying, guys. <laughs> I really was. Looking for some. You put it in your oatmeal. That's the key. That's the health it was. Forget yeah, you, flu shots. Yeah. Put honey in your any, oatmeal. I would say anything that you want to put uh, uh, sugar in, you could use use honey in a place. It's a know? great alternative. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a great alternative. Yeah. So you can put it in iced tea or hot tea? Or is oh, it yeah. better in hot tea? I, it's... Cause it's it's better in hot tea because it, you know, it dissolves in there pretty good, and you stir it around, and you get the taste of it. Yeah. Okay. What about oatmeal? Or? Yeah, you put in oatmeal. Oatmeal. Yeah, okay. I put it in I'm oatmeal still digging. Myself. Guys, hang in there. I'm still digging. <laughs> what else did he put honey into? Uh no, nah, that's that's as far as I've gone. Okay. It. Yeah, but but honey, uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing substance. You know that honey, um, when it's wet, if you put it on a wound, it turns into peroxide. Really? It does. See, now it we're does. digging. See? That's somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I had to learn that in the, uh, the journeyman class. I had no uh, idea. Class. Yeah. It, um, it turns into peroxide on a wound. Um, and I use uh, a different other herbs that we have around there, like comfrey. You, um, comfrey, will, uh, it's, it's good for scratches and such as that. And I mix that with the uh, honey and, and then the reishi mushroom, which is good on your skin as well. Hmm. So, yeah, it's good. Excellent. Yeah. And you brought some other goodies. Tell us about this thing here. It says black truffle salt. Yeah, that's from my mentor there. In she, by the way, they're having a, a conference this weekend in uh, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. Um, her name is Jane Morgan Smith. This is her company, uh, Truffles, North Carolina. She has, this is a, actually a truffle honey. I don't know if you can see that. It has uh, little flecks of black 
uh, truffle. Mm -hmm. This one has the same and, thing. It's, yeah. It's a salt, and I guess, a, but it's yeah, got black truffles. Yes. As well. Yes. That's good on popcorn. Oh, everyone <laughs> loves popcorn. Good on popcorn and your eggs in the morning. So, yeah, truffles are, that, that's a, uh, that's an education within itself. We, like I said, we just got back from uh, Barcelona where we had a uh, um, uh, seven day uh, seminar where they wined us and dined us and had all kinds of uh, uh, truffle dinners and such as that. And we got truffle education, how to grow your trees, what things you might be doing wrong, you know, what type of trees to grow, what trees grow the fast, uh, the fastest, uh, truffles in a shorter period of time. And oh, I see. So, and they'll be covering that this weekend in uh, Charlottesville. Excellent. Uh, Virginia, yes. So tell me, uh, Let's talk a little bit, I only have a couple minutes left, but tell me something that's been a struggle that you overcame. You mentioned, obviously, there's a learning curve when it comes to planting in the South and using clay. Oh, my goodness. Uh, maybe a low point, which you learn from it. And maybe it's, you got education, maybe you got certified. We have, and then maybe a high point, you know, something that you say, honey, we hit the jackpot, look at our garden. Yeah. yeah we, because there are lots of highs and lows in entrepreneurship, and especially in gardening. Obviously, you can't control the weather, but you have the greenhouse that's right. to help control the weather. That's right. Uh, is there any takeaways that you could share with the audience? If they want to start their own garden or if they want to plant certain foods, anything you recommend? Any if you want to things. start your garden, we, we have chickens too and uh, um, we, uh, we raise them uh, with a non-GMO feed. They, uh, their a our eggs are non-GMO and a lot of the uh, uh, restaurants and things, they, they clamor for them. Uh, I'm a veteran and uh, uh, one of the things that uh, helped as a veteran was I, I through the... Uh, uh, Farm Vetco, which is a Farmers Veterans Coalition, I, I was able to obtain a walk behind tractor, and that was a that was a high for me. You know, I was able to get that, and it helped out with uh, uh, doing my uh, rows on the farm, uh, doing putting my garden into place, and uh, being able to network with different people and getting the uh, the high tunnel. That was a big high. Uh, one of the uh, one of the lows was you know when you know, you have, when you have your, your flock of chickens, you know, and, you know, you come home and hawks are taking them out. Uh -oh. Coyotes come in, you know, it, and we've gone from, we had like 100 chickens and we've gone, we're down to like less than 40 now. Wow. Because of it. That's a, that's a low, you know, you have to deal with that. And so, um, you take it in stride. Uh, as far as the, uh, the vegetable side uh, of, uh, how specialty farms, uh, there's issues with the high tunnel where uh, it was uh, it was flooding. Mm. It was flooding at one point, and uh, we I was at a loss for what to do, so I dug a trench and uh, worked through the um, the uh, uh, the uh, people that I got purchased it through, um, and they helped me to figure out a way to uh, deal with the, the flooding issue, and so it doesn't flood as much, as much anymore. I mean, we're still working with uh, some of the issues there, but uh, you know, it's always it's always a work in progress. Sure. You know, and and just you know, working through not only uh, the aspects, the physical aspects of farming, because it can be very rigorous. Sure. You know? Um, but it's, it's getting your website up, getting your, your business going, um, and trying to, you know, work those angles there. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of what, uh, we've gone through. And keeping your head up and being patient and oh, oh, persistence oh, and yeah, that's, you know, learning from your mistakes and learning what grows, what doesn't grow. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. uh, when you had to remediate the, the, the field, did you start with a quarter acre? What, when you first did the remediation, how big of a space did you start with? We started with... Uh, um, with the remediation part of it. Oh, with the remediation part? We, yeah, it was right, right at a quarter acre. And, a quarter acre, uh, okay. we, we, put the, we put the chickens out there, and, and chickens are amazing. You know, they, they, we put them out there for a year, we let them stay out there, and then we moved them away, and uh, the soil started to remediate oh, with the chickens because the chickens were there on that soil, and we, we put compost in there, and, you know, did a lot of remediation, and we when we got our analysis back, it shows wow, hey, you know, you need to slow down because you're you're doing too good. <laughs> you got too much uh, of this mineral here, so you know, just put it in check. You know, and so that's how we uh, that's how we worked it. I find that very intriguing. Yeah, and I'm sure those of you watching, I'm sure you, uh, you have farms or you have gardens. 
And uh, it's always a hit or miss, and it's always a learning process. And this is a young man that decided to learn from his mistakes, and we didn't have the answers. He sought help. Yeah. And I think it's one of the biggest keys is surround yourself by people that have been there, done that, yeah. and experience people with gardening and, and farming and, and learn from your mistakes. And uh, I think the number that still sticks in my head is $1,500 a pound for truffles. Yeah, well, that's, that's only the black. The white, uh, white truffles go for like $2,000. Wow. Two you saved three. the grand finale for the end, huh? <laughs> now we're the talking. High, <laughs> the highest price paid for a truffle was $300,000. Wow. That's a white truffle. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate your information, right. and yeah. uh, I think it's been an entertaining show, and I hope all of you watching have enjoyed it, and you're watching the Perky Collar Radio and TV show, and we will see you next week. I'm your host, David M. Frankel. Next time.